No margin, no mission. You've all heard the phrase, no margin, no mission. The traditional meaning is that unless we preserve our financial uh, margins, that we'll lose sight and the ability to sustain our mission. This is true for individuals, families, organizations, companies, and even countries. Here's the definition, here's the technical definition for margin. Frankly, it's the proportion of a company's revenue that is left after the variable costs of production have been paid. For companies, margin is essential to weather the unexpected expenses or decreases in revenue without having to liquidate assets, liquidate staff positions, or limit the mission. It's essential to recapitalize and to sustain the mission long term. There are several ways to increase margin. One is to increase revenue, one is to control expenses, another is to combine the two, and countries have another option, they can print money. For the rest of us, we don't have that option. There are typically many factors, though, on the equation, and we spend a lot of time in the budget process. Who here thinks that we spend a lot of time in the budget process? Anybody? Yeah. It's important, don't get me wrong, but we don't spend nearly as much time trying to preserve margin in our own lives. The importance of margin in our lives, I would say, is at least equal to the financial margin in what we do. Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. The exam is part of any physician's evaluation, and I'm a physician, so here goes. When contemplating what to speak about today, I thought about the title of the event, Revive. Vive, or its variants in the Romantic languages, is the subjunctive form of the Latin verb to live. Re obviously means to do it again. Scientifically, to be alive means breathing, growing, replicating, consuming, and for sentient beings like us, there's self-awareness involved as well. Re implies that we are to live again. Implicit in the title revive is the concept that we were alive, now we're less so, and that we have a need to and strive to be alive again. So how are we doing? Let's be honest with ourselves for a minute. I would venture to say that a significant percentage of us here feel like we're either losing ground or coasting in our personal relationships. Some of this has to do with our choices. Recent surveys demonstrate that the average father spends between seven and 20 minutes daily with their children in meaningful dialogue. That's not with each child, that's in aggregate. It's between seven and 20 minutes. So if you have a bunch of kids like I do, that doesn't leave a lot of time for each one. Yet at the same time, the average adult in the United States spends 2.8 hours a day watching television and an equal amount of time in non-work-related internet activities. Some of it has to do with what we expect of each other professionally. For example, a recent advisory board study stated that for the average primary care physician to optimally manage the average panel of 2,500 patients using the traditional model of care that it would take 21.7 hours a day. It's not gonna work. We can't do it doing it the normal way. New ways are needed. How often do you put your head on the pillow at night, confident that you've accomplished everything that you really needed to accomplish that day? Anybody? How often do you wake up rested and eager to go face the day again, knowing that you're caught up and ready to tackle what comes your way? If you're like me, sometimes you might find that you feel a little bit more like a human doing than a human being. Life 
is stressful. Does anyone disagree with that? Don't think so. Not all stress is bad, though. Hans Selye, in 1956, wrote a book called The Stress of Life, and he was a Hungarian endocrinologist. And he said that there are essentially two different types of stress. One is eustress, or good stress. The other is distress. Stress is interesting. The same actual activity can be both eustress, or good stress, and distress. For example, exercise. It can be distressing to get up and exercise. That's not what I'm talking about, though. What I mean is that a little bit of exercise, incrementally building, is the activity that's actually needed to stress our body, stress our muscles, stress our heart and lungs and our bones in such a way that they respond to that by growing stronger. But too much of it is harmful and leads to injury. For most of us, our time to task ratio is out of whack, and we can feel way too stressed. An example of another type of stress that, that is, is interesting, and, and it can mean different things to different people, is this right here. I'm speaking to you right now, and it's kind of fun. But for other people, this activity in and of itself could be mortifying. Now, my heart rate's up, okay, so it is stress. My mouth's a little dry, just like yours would be, but it is fun. So some of this has to do with our own personal orientation to what's going on. We all have different capacities as well to manage activity, to manage stress. Some people can manage a lot very well. My wife is one of those people. She can juggle this and juggle that, and it's really amazing to watch her. Other people are more plotters, like myself, kind of focus, 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 accomplish, move on to the next thing, focus, 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 accomplish. Another example of it having to do with capacity is running. The world record for the mile is three minutes and 43 seconds. At one point, I was a runner, and my personal best in the mile was four minutes and 15 seconds. Not bad, pretty quick, but clearly not world record pace. But what's important here is to realize that it had to do with my capacity. It wasn't an issue of desire, planning, strategy, technique, or training. Granted, all those things played into me getting to four minutes and 15 seconds, but I just could not cover any more ground in that period of time. Each one of us has a finite capacity. Each one of us has a certain amount of time, but we oftentimes find ourselves feeling like we don't have enough time. The reality is that time is the great leveler. All of us have exactly the same amount of time every day. None of us can bank it. We can't make more. Time is dispensed one unit at a time. It's really, pardon me for saying it, the ultimate just-in-time inventory management process. But frankly, we can't really even ensure that the very next second is coming our way. All we can really do is to choose how we're going to spend the time that we're granted. Many of us respond to that reality by feeling so compelled to be productive that we overbook ourselves so heavily that we feel really like we don't get anything done. There's a physician I know, his friend of mine, his name's Dr. Richard Swenson. He faced that reality in his clinical life as a doctor. And he wrote a book about it called Margin where he described his journey from being overloaded to one of personal margin, and about the phenomenon of overscheduled lives and the need for change. In it, he says that we strategize proactively to preserve financial margin, yet we hesitate to effectively and proactively preserve our most valuable asset, time. The stress that comes from losing margin in our personal lives takes a heavy toll on us. 
left out of control, it can tear you down. It can damage your relationships, negate your joy in life, rob your contentment, and steal your hope. It can lead to divorce, depression, dependency, disease, disengagement from relationships and reality. A book I recently read called Essentialism shows this pretty clearly. If we strive to do the things that are popular and try to do everything and try to do it now, we have this overlapping area which is called the highest point of frustration. It's true. So let's examine a little bit more. This is Sir Isaac Newton. In 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published his treatise on motion called Principia Mathematica. To my estimation, many of the laws of physics apply to behavior as well. Let me give you some examples. This is one of my sons. This illustrates one of the laws of motion. Objects at rest remain at rest. <laughs> Here's another one, one of my daughters. Objects in motion remain in motion unless acted upon by another object. And here this is, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. They're fighting over a pillow pet. I believe that these laws really do apply to human interaction. One of the laws of physics that supports the concept of overload, it's actually an application of those laws of motion. It's a formula of work. Work equals force times distance. If our personal capacity for work is finite, how are we gonna choose how to spend our time? Let's look at this one. We have a finite energy or capacity for getting things done. If we choose to try to do everything and exert this finite energy, the ball basically just kind of quivers in place and doesn't really make much movement. Whereas if we focus a bit strategically and apply all the energy in a good direction, Look at the movement that we get. Work equals force times direction. And what we can end up with is this. If we choose to do the right thing at the right reason for the right time, we get the highest point of contribution. But in order to do that, we have to define each one of these circles. The only option that we have to really maximize the time that we have is to spend it on the right things sustainably. So how do we do that? Determine our mission. Come up with your own personal mission statement. Because if you don't, others will for you. Determine your capacity. I suggest that you gauge your capacity based on the status of your relationships. Give people around you permission to speak to you and say, hey, you know, I think you might be overloading a little bit. You need to pull back. Plan your time accordingly. Be focused. True multitasking doesn't really work very well for most of us. We end up doing a halfway job at the things that we're trying to do. My wife is probably an exception to that. Be present. How often do we find ourselves surfing on our phones or tablets when spending time with the people that are most important to us? I see it all the time in the mall, in parks, very, very common. Be willing to walk away from good things. Now this one's really, really hard. I don't wanna get preachy, but many would assert that Jesus was probably one of the best time managers there ever was. And one of the best people at choosing on what to focus on. Yet the accounts in the New Testament are very clear that he walked away from every city, leaving people behind that needed to be ministered to and still needed to be healed. We have to figure out what the good things are for us to do at that given time. Be interruptible. The most important times in life don't happen on a schedule, and oftentimes they're not planned. Do we wake up in the morning and go, today I'm gonna find out about my next job opportunity and it's gonna be awesome. No, we don't, it just kinda happens. Today I'm gonna meet my spouse. Did that happen to any one of you where you woke up and said, today I'm gonna to meet my spouse? No, I don't think so. Did any one of us say, today my kid is gonna reach out and do something really amazing that's gonna make it all worth it? 
it just happens to us. And it doesn't happen if we're not interruptible. Two quick clinical examples. One, I was rounding one day in the hospital and I overheard a nurse talking to another nurse about a little boy who had been admitted to the hospital. He was 11 years old and he'd come in with an emergency ruptured appendix. He'd gone through his surgery well and was recovering reasonably well, but had a slow return to bowel function and his surgeon was pretty conservative and didn't want to feed him yet until he'd had some activity from below, so to speak. We all know that drill. Well, I overheard this, and being a father of some 11-year-old boys, I thought, you know, I might have a solution for this. So I said to the nurse, come with me. Let's go visit this little boy. I sat down in his room. We talked about his Nintendo DS that he was playing with for a little while. And then I said, I understand you have a problem. And he said, what's that? I said, well, you know, you're not. He said, yeah, that's true. I said, are you hungry? Yes. Would you like to eat? Yes. You understand your doc's not going to let you eat until there's some activity from below. And he said, yeah, that's what I understand. I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I think I know how to fix this. Put your finger out. So he put his finger out. And I said, in just a second, I'm going to do something. And you know exactly what to do. So he put his finger out. I pulled his finger. He responded the way any self-respecting 11-year-old boy would. (laughs) I stood up from the bed. And I said, my work here is done. I walked out. The nurse was laughing, his mom was laughing, the boy was laughing. I even went so far as to write a little mock procedure note and stick it in the chart for the surgeon just for grins. Another story. It was a typical busy night on call in the hospital, and I was... If you've ever covered a hospital service at night, one of the things you know is around 9 o'clock, the patients who are in the hospital who have dementia sometimes start a process called sundowning, and they'll become confused. One of the things, this happened one night, and there was a patient who'd been admitted to the hospital with pneumonia, and uh, the nurses called me for the first of what I thought would be many sedation rounds, where they call and say, Mr. Jones is, is hollering, mama, mama, and waking up all the other patients on the floor will you please call in some Ativan for him? But for some reason, rather than doing that this time, I actually decided to go visit with the patient. I sat on the edge of the bed and I said, Mr. Jones, I'm Dr. Myers, tell me about mama. So he started to talk about mama and I'd read his chart and it turns out that the person he was referring to as mama was his wife who had died 15 years earlier. And he starts to tell me about mama and as he's doing so, he starts to tell me about when they met and when they dated and when they got married, and when they had kids. And as he did so, the years just fell away from his face and a sparkle returned to his eyes. And after he finished, I said, wow, she sounds amazing. He said, yeah. He said, I got a deal for you. Look, I gotta be up all night anyway. You've told me a lot about mama. Why don't you go to sleep? And if I see her, I'll come and let you know. He said, you do that for me? I said, yeah. And he turned and he closed his eyes and he drifted off to sleep because he was exhausted. He'd been doing this for days. And as he did, I thought to myself, in his dreams, he's with mama again. So in a very real sense, I did help him find mama that night. Now, I don't share these examples with you to say that I get this right all the time. If you ask any one of my family, they'd tell you, no, he does not get this right all the time. Rather, I say more that if I can do this, it's something that any one of you can do. Our mission here is people caring for people together. I would posit that success in our mission absolutely requires margin, not just on our financial statements, but in our lives. I'm going to skip over this part and move on to this. You're like, what is that? This is a document that all of you are familiar with. What I did is tempting to try to fill our lives. Imagine that our lives, each of us has a page and we can fill it with whatever we want. I like word pictures and this is literally a word picture. It's tempting to try to fill it to the brim with as much content as we possibly can pack in. In order to try to do that for my page, 
What I did was I removed all the punctuation and capital letters. Those things just take up extra room anyway. They're not really important. And I also removed the spaces between the letters because, it, you know, they're just spaces between the letters. And I pushed the words out to the margins of the page. As I said, this document's familiar to us, but does it make any sense? To, can anyone here really read this document? When we try to get our lives too full, what do we try to do? We try to prioritize. Okay, so let's just say I prioritized. And in order to illustrate prioritization, I added capital letters back in where they're supposed to be. Is it any clearer now? Let's add the punctuation back in where it's supposed to be and see if that makes it clear. No, it really doesn't help yet. It's only when we add the spaces back into the content, spaces between the words, spaces between the sentences, the margins back in, that it begins to make sense. This document happens to be the US Constitution. I used that today because Monday, we're gonna remember people who gave their all in support of this document. Our personal page in life can hold all of this, but it loses the meaning. What do you want? Do you want it to be packed full to the brim or would you like to have some meaning? No margin, no mission, thank you.